Josephine Hennenkamp, and I served in World War II as a nurse with the 77th Evacuation Hospital, which was organized from the KU Medical Center. And most of our nurses and doctors were from Kansas. I was born Josephine Zeman to, with my family on a farm north, southwest of Dorns. And I went to school in a one-room schoolhouse through grade school. Then I went to high school in Wilson High School. And after getting out of high school, one week out of high school, I came in nurses training at St. John's Hospital here in Salina. So, but we had to stay in town in order to go to high school because there was no way you could drive because the roads were never cleared in the winter time for you to be able to drive to school. One year we had a, a room that we lived in that we rented and then uh, I stayed with an aunt for two years and then I stayed with my sister got married and she lived in the country and I stayed with her the la my senior year and rode the bus into school. I had a cousin that was killed while I was still, a, when I was just about out of high school and her sister was in training here and she came home. She was a senior nurse in training here. She came home and her and I were with her, with my cousin when she passed away. So after the funeral, my cousin says, Jody, do you think you th would like to be a nurse? And I said, well, I would thought so, but I wasn't sure. And she said, I think you could be. And so I came back with her parents when they went to see about, to bring her back. And she told sister, Jody thinks she wants to be a nurse. And sister looked me over and she said, you look big enough. You look strong enough. You can come the 15th of June. But then she called my aunt a week or so later and asked that I should come the 1st of June. So that gave me one week out of high school and I was in nurses training. So when I got in training, I went right to the floor. I was dressed in my uniform and I went up on the floor and sister took me in the room with the patient and she set me in a rocker and she went ahead and gave the patient a bath and took care of the patient. And then the next day, she sat down in the rocker and she told me to go ahead and take care of the patient. And from then on, I was assigned patients and I started working, being assigned patients each morning. And you, you bathed the patient and you cleaned the room did everything was done by the students. We had classes throughout the days. We had in the evening. You, you always, during the week, you had either study hall or classes. Some of the doctors taught classes and some of the sisters taught classes. And then we went to Marymount for part of our classes. We took chemistry and, and uh, some of our harder classes. We walked to Marymount from St. John's Hospital on the days that we had class. In my class, I think there were 11 that graduated. And then I worked a year before I went in the service. Well, we knew that there was problems, but we really knew we were in it. When Pearl Harbor happened, everybody knew that we were in a war. When, when Pearl Harbor broke out, I was, on, I was in charge of the OB department at St. John's and we had a lot of young mothers that, that just had their new babies, they were young mothers. And it came on the radio that Pearl Harbor was hit. And of course everybody knew we were in war then, which all the mothers were quite upset because they were young, they had young husbands, and of course then they turn around and they say, you'll probably get drafted because they'll have to have nurses. And that's what we heard from then on, that you'll probably be drafted. 
So we decided that we would join, but we couldn't decide what we wanted to do, what branch of the service we wanted to go into. We kind of were checking and come to find out one of our doctors was going in with, he was from the KU Medical Center, Dr. Snyder, here from Salina, and he said, well, why don't you go with us? He said, we'll go together and we'll stay together. And we, we checked into it and signed up to go with the 77th Evacuation Hospital, which the government had asked the KU Medical Center to organize an evacuation hospital. And so it was mostly staffed by doctors and nurses from Kansas. We really we didn't worry too much. We, my mother didn't think I should go, and I kind of convinced her that, I told her, I said, well, do you have a son there? I said, if he has to go, he might be over there and then there'll be nobody to take care of him. And if he gets hurt, she looked at me and she said, you better go. We, we went to Fort Leonard Wood. We didn't go to Kansas City until we went right off to Fort Leonard Wood with the unit. I mean, we went back to visit in Kansas City, visit, met our boyfriends there, but uh, I met Bob there a couple of times after we were in, because he was still in the service. He wasn't gone yet. He left after I did. I met him when I was in nurse's training on a blind date. We had a nice time, and we had a, and he, he, he was a good guy. We drove to Bennington, my girlfriend and her boyfriend, she was from Bennington, and, and we drove down there, and I don't know, we didn't do too much. Got in a little late, and sister was kind of, act, you'd have thought we was a half hour late, and we were only a few minutes late. But that was part of the game, you were to get home on time. We went to Fort Leonard Wood right after, that's what our orders read, to report to Fort Leonard Wood. And we got there and we didn't have our uniforms or anything. We went to work, they said they wanted us to learn the Army record keeping and so forth, which we did nothing like that after we left there. But anyhow, we worked with the girls on the floors part of the time. We just had to drill, march, things like that. We didn't shoot no rifles or nothing. And did some training, we did some uh, drill. We had to learn to be soldiers right quick. We were out there in the field drilling in our white uniforms because we had no other uniforms. Fact is, when we left and went on the train to go to uh, New York to go, go on the ship, we didn't even have our whole issue of our clothing. They issued us stuff in New York on the ship because we were only, when we were six weeks in the service, we were on the water going to England. nice ships that we went on. They were, the fact is they were luxury liners and they were converted into tr uh, to troop carrying ships. Well, of course, the officers and the nurses, they got the quarters that the lay people used when they uh, traveled. And they had the same dining room and had the same people waiting tables for us that did it in civilian life. Of course, they were still, it was just changed over right a short time before, but the enlisted men were all put down. They were in, weren't as nice, put up as what, that was a bad thing about when we'd go on ships because we were well acquainted, you know, we worked with these guys and then we'd be sitting there in the dining room and they'd come by and have to carry their mess kit to get their food and we were sitting there in the dining room. <laughs> they used to razz us about it because we were sitting in there. Of course, they used, they wished it to us, but it was, as far as the ships we went on, the British ones were pretty nice. 
all our trips were all two weeks because the ships couldn't go straight. They always zigzagged to keep from getting sunk. And it took twice as long to get any place. And they, you went in a convoy. There would be several ships together and they'd all be uh, going back and forth in the water. They didn't go straight. If you could eat by the guys, they'd, they'd bring you food as long as you'd eat it. A lot of the people got sick, but I never did. I, I liked the ship. It didn't bother me at all. It would rain sometimes. It wasn't be cloudy. It was just like any time on a ship. You know, you get out in there in the ocean and it's you see nothing but water, and sometimes it's rainy and sometimes sunshine. Well, we went to Liverpool. We always landed in Liverpool in England. Because we landed there when we come here, and we landed there when we came back from Africa. So there was all kinds of people out there, and even one time it was a group of, they had people just like we had here, you know, some people that were kind of ornery and nasty, and we were out there on the deck, and you heard them holler, uh, suckers, suckers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you didn't pay any attention to them. But sometimes they had a band playing out there. We went in, the nurses went to, and stayed with a, a group from, they were from the United States that were running a hospital over there. It was some kind of studies they were doing over there. And they had a hospital, and they had a pretty nice nurse's quarters and plenty of room that they put us up. The enlisted men and the doctors all had to go out in pup tents. But the nurses stayed at that time. And then we moved out into a, a hospital that was being in the process of being built by the British, but it wasn't quite finished. And so it was a lot of cleaning up to do around it. And we cleaned it up and set it up, and that's where we got our things organized. We started taking care of patients there right away and part of our training, because we really hadn't been together too much with the whole group, with our enlisted men, because when we went to Fort Leonard Wood, we had doctors and nurses, but we didn't have any enlisted men. Well, there was a hospital there, a group of enlisted men that were organized to go with another evac hospital, but they didn't have any doctors or nurses. So they transferred them in to us, and they were well trained. Some of them had trained in surgery at Fitzsimmons in Colorado, and, and they had real good we had some real good orderlies trained. On our tents, you had two big tents that were butted together, and each one had 20 patients. And one nurse had two, the tents were butted together, so you had 40 patients, and then you had an orderly in each tent with you. Well, you have orderlies in the hospital that come around and do those kind of things. They're not trained you know, to give medicines or nothing, but they are trained to help take care of the patients. They can bathe patients, get them whatever they needed, help feed them, help undress them, clean them up. Same thing they do now. We, when we set up our unit with this little hospital that they had built and cleaned it up, and then we took care of a few patients, but we also did training. We had to they assigned us to what duties. See, we had never been together before as a unit, and they had to have nurses to give anesthetics. We had one doctor that gave anesthetics, and he, they asked for eight nurses to volunteer to give anesthetics, which I volunteered to do that. And so he trained us, gave us training, you know, we did have a few patients there, the people that were stationed around there. And uh, we were close to Bath, England then. That's what I did all during the service mostly, uh, except when there wasn't a lot of surgeries, well then we'd help on the floors in the tents, you know, and that. You know, if you 
when there weren't surgeries going on. But most of the time, when we had casualties, you were busy. You know, you was one surgery after another. So it was in October that we got on the ship to go to Af Africa. We didn't have any idea where we were going. Just before we landed, they handed out little notebooks, how to behave in North Africa. And then it was announced on the radio a few days later that they landed in North Africa. We landed in Iran. They landed in three different places, but we landed in Iran. But there wasn't supposed to be any fighting. They thought they had it arranged it with the French that there wouldn't be any fighting. But when they got into the harbor, they opened up fire on them and sunk some ships in the harbor. So we couldn't get into the harbor. So they unloaded us on little boats and took us to shore to go over to take care of patients. So our equipment couldn't get off the ship for a few days. We just had to take care of patients that were already in the hospitals. There were two hospitals there had patients that didn't have any care yet at all. Some of them, there were no sheets on the beds. I went to work. We didn't have our surgical equipment or anything. And there was most of their stuff was removed from the hospital. So we were just working and we, under conditions, no food, no nothing. We all had to, when we moved, we always carried rations with us. Everybody was issued rations to carry in case you, know, you ever run on that they didn't have food, that you'd have some. So we turned in our ration that we were carrying so we could feed these patients who hadn't had anything to eat. There were British, French, all, all kinds of them, but a lot of Americans, mostly. And there was nobody to take care of them. The French, some of the French were there. I remember I went on night duty on this ward. I had two big wards. I had one big ward full of patients. Then I had to walk down a hall and there was windows were broke out of this, uh, out of it because after there was a lot of bombing and stuff. So the windows were knocked out. So it was cold, the hallways were cold. It was bad, bad. There were no blankets, no, some of the beds had no sheets on them. And it was, it was nothing to hear a patient holler, a bed bug bit them. And, and most of them just they'd slap some surgery, some dressing on them, but there wasn't, dressings hadn't been changed or anything. It was a rough deal then, but we got them cleaned up and taken care of and transferred them back then to other hospitals. And it was a doctor to, you know, make rounds and that. That night, the first night there, why, this one doctor, Dr. Rumholtz, says, come by and he said, well, do you think you still want to be an army nurse? I said, well, I'm here. <laughs> Got some tents and they pitched our tents. That was our first experience of getting out in tents and it rained about every day. The Arabs said it never rained that much ever before is what it rained. We always call that mud flats because it was, you, everybody had to ditch their tents to keep the water from running through them and everything. We had wall tents. We didn't have shoes. Our the supply issued us our slippers. We were issued just dress slippers, and we got out there in this mud. Well, they they gave they issued us some men's the smallest shoes, regular boots, you know, lace up shoes to wear while we were there. We just didn't have the equipment and they issued us, we were issued a wrap around seersucker uniform, which to crawl in and out of these tents and a tent had to be tied up tight so that you wouldn't let any light out if you had any light in it. And you couldn't crawl in and out of a tent with these wrap around uniforms that they issued us. And so the supply issued us men's coveralls. We ripped the belt back and, and uh, tightened it up and some of them cut them off that were too long. And 
and wore regular men's cutoffs. We didn't get regular uh, cut off, regular coveralls until the wax came in existence. There were no wax when we left the states, and after they they had a, had a, a coveralls, two piece women's. So they issued us some of them then, and the last few, about the first year we wore these other things that were issued to us. You know, we moved quite frequently, just all across Africa, and I don't remember the names of the places because we were always out in the field. They'd go out and find a nice place field to pitch tents. See, we were a 750 bed hospital. We could expand to a thousand, and that took a lot of room. And we always set up, and they put a big red cross out in the field outside so the airplanes could see that we were a hospital. And we never had any trouble, because you had, it was a big, big area of uh, tents. When they were brought in, the doctor would check them out and see how bad their wounds were and everything. And they were kind of marked or after surgery, depending on how bad they were, as to where they were to go. See, we, our casualties came right from the front. We had to be close enough so the ambulances could bring them to the, to the hospital. And we operated on them and put them in casts and things. And then they were marked, well, it was, they were scheduled according, we weren't supposed to have our patients over 24 hours. And we, they would either be marked to go to a station hospital or a general hospital. If they were patients that were going to be going back to duty before too long, you know, just minor wounds, why they were sent to a station hospital. And if they were more, probably need a little more surgery or something, more care, they were sent to a general hospital. And then if they were real bad, and they figured they'd never go back to duty, where well, they were marked to go to the States, or sometimes they'd send them to England and then to the States. But they uh, would try to get them on an airplane if they could. Normally, it, it, when there was fighting, would be full, but they would be emptying as, you know, because each day they, they were sending, pre people were coming in day and night. We'd get in more patients at night than in the daytime. And we were doing just as much surgery at night as in the daytime, because you just, they were scheduled for surgery. They had doctors in the, in the admissions to mark what, where their wounds were and, and how bad they were. And you know, they were scheduled, those that needed to be done right away or, and uh, scheduled for surgery, that we'd have a big schedule in, in our uh, operating room and they were added on as, and if someone came in that needed right away, you'd work those in, because you had people operating all the time. I'd be put and have two patients with me. They were always, uh, their head, you know, catty corner. If they were minor things, I could give two, because we gave a lot of pentothal, and you could do those. And we'd have to keep them long enough to start waking up so the patient was able to swallow and respond a little when they were waking up because you had litter bearers that were, you know, carrying patients in and out into the other tents. So you had to have them kind of responding some before you send them out. And they'd bring in another one and you could put them to sleep and they'd work on them. Pentothal was a IV you give morphine and pentothal. And then for, if you were doing a big case with gas, then you only did one. But most, you, were, you weren't putting them both to sleep at the same time, but you had one that was waking up a little bit that you were watching at the same time to keep them till they were able to, you know, handle their own breathing and stuff. We worked 12 hour duty. We worked from seven to seven day and night, day or night, whichever. We always worked, when we 
you would never you change shift each time you moved. See, when the fighting would go on, as soon as they'd get up too far ahead, that they'd have to bring the patients back too far. Well, hospitals would leapfrog another hospital, would leapfrog over us, and when we'd get back, then we'd go ahead of them. But you'd always have one hospital that would be close enough so the ambulances could bring them. But when you got too far back, well, all your patients were sent on back and you packed up everything and moved. They could move that big hospital in a matter of a couple of days. Yeah, if you were on one shift and one moved, you went on the other shift. Well, you were busy, you didn't really. It was, you were just used to doing it. I went on a, with a surgical team and this, they had just come from the States and their colonel said, you've reached your peak in eight hours. And he had them going eight hours on and eight hours off. Well, that was terrible because you never knew whether it was daytime or nighttime. I would get up, you didn't know whether you should take a flashlight and you took your meals on your eight hours off and your sleep and you worked eight hours. And that was harder than just working the eight hours, the 12 hours. Africa, after we ended up in Africa, the fighting, well, we went back to, to Sicily. We went to Sicily and worked there. And then, uh, well, our, part of our unit went for the landing. We went in after they landed. In, but some of our enlisted men, a couple of our doctors had to go in on the ships when they were landing. Our one doctor got the Silver Star for getting all the patients off of a ship that was sunk, was sinking, and he managed to get all the injured people off of it onto their ship and got them out of there. And uh, the ship was sunk, the one ship was sunk there in the harbor and, and they, uh, he got all the patients off, they said. He didn't leave the ship till he got them all off. And then we came in after, after they had landed. Well, it was just a lot of things tore up and bombed and shot up, you know. Every place you went where there was fighting, we, we always traveled on the back of a truck so you could see what, what had been going on behind you after you moved on. Oh, there was, there was still fighting going on. We, we just went on and set up our hospitals and we'd have to get, you'd have to get your equipment all off the, so that took a lot of stuff to get off the ship and we couldn't uh, set up a hospital without our equipment and they'd have to unload a ship in order to get it. One time we were with an outfit I went on with the surgical team and they were shooting shells over to our shells were going over top of us because we had a, they set the hospital up where the sh our guns were going above us. I mean, you always heard the shooting. And then you had a lot of buzz bombs that went off during the, you know, buzz bombs were un unmanned little airplanes like that sounded like a little wash machine, you know, like our old wash machines used to sound. And they'd be flying through the air. And like they always said, as long as you heard them, you were safe. Because when it shut off, that's when it would drop and explode. Wherever there was fighting. It wasn't, they started more in England, over England. But you just hoped and prayed they kept going. Uh, our hospital was hit was bombed once with our own airplanes in uh, uh, Belgium. It was in Belgium, yeah, I think. Belgium, of course, it was a schoolhouse that we were in there that it had been used for a lot of other things. And our own planes bombed us when we were moving in. Didn't nobody got hurt too bad, knocked some windows out. But the Germans had been using it for uh, they had an ordnance outfit in there and 
different things, and then the Americans had something in there, and then they moved us in there. That was when we got over to Belgium, though. The only place we were, the longest we were any place was in Bone, Africa, and that time we were, our orders got lost. We were on a British officer's desk, and we were there for four months, and we couldn't, a colonel finally sent a orders to, to find out how come we were still there. And they said, where have you been? We haven't been able to find you. And uh, they put a tracer on it and found that our orders were laying on the British officer's desk. In Sicily, we went back to England to get, to get ready to go over to France. Well, we had several months that we went over to England. We went over to England from Africa and they built us in with in British homes. They, the British, they called them bobbies, they were police-like. They took us around and they said, we weren't being forced on these people that they wanted us, that uh, nobody was forced. But we did find out when I went to, when I went to the one place, the police, the bobbies, they called them bobbies, they took us around in a truck and took our luggage to the homes where we were assigned. And he said, now you're not being assigned, you're, these people want you. Well, I, the place I was assigned to, the lady was, nobody was home, nobody answered the door. So he left my, I left my things next door where my girlfriend was staying. And uh, we went there that night and her husband came to the door and said, my wife has a doctor's certificate that she doesn't have to take anybody. Well, that told you that they were forced to take somebody. Well, before, before we left it in this Bobby, we called him and he said, we'll go down the street to Jones and, and we went over there and I went over there. And it was a real nice place. They, f they felt sorry for us when we moved out, when, when moved out into our tents and we were so happy to move out, you know, cause we had a stove and we had, everything in our tents, and everybody was together. We were happy to get out in our tents. They were, they were rationed a bucket of coal a day, but when they had Americans staying with them, they were given an extra bucket of coal. And the house where I stayed in, she would, at about four o'clock in the evening, she'd build a fire in the fireplace, and they'd sit around that every night. And that first night, I about froze to death. I was so cold. Next morning, I come down, and she says, how did you sleep? I said, I didn't. She said, what was the matter? And I said, I was cold. So boy, after that, they had a hot water bottle in my bed every night and more blankets. And the people I stayed with were very nice, very nice. Yeah, well, we spent some time there, and then they moved us out in tents. But we had to, we left all our equipment in Africa. They didn't ship any of that stuff back. And they had to reissue us our tents and everything. We had to get everything ready to use over for the landing. Well, they knew that's what they were gonna do. We knew that before we even left Africa, that, that from Sicily, the chief nurse came and said that we would be going in on the landing in France, or if we wanted to go to the Pacific, all we had to do to tell her, and she'd transfer us there. But we all chose to go on with our outfit. Well, we, there were ships out there we couldn't, and uh, we couldn't set up our hospital when we got there. But we each had to carry a half of a pup tent in our, in our bag that we carried. You always carried a half of a pup tent. And so when we landed in France, they took us out in the field, and we had to pitch your pup tent, your half, with another person, your one of your friends, and two of us sleep in a pup tent. So we, for about a little over a week or more, we slept in pup tents out in the field. And so many, well, they fastened at the top, you know, overlapped, and that you didn't, and then you had to crawl in them. You were down on your hands and knees and crawled in. They were small, just room enough for two people to sleep in there. 
but they, you couldn't carry a whole one yourself. We didn't have any of our sleeping bags or anything yet. Those were all down in the hole on the ship. We were out in a big field and it was, their fields were all hedgerows. They had, their fields were all made up with hedgerows planted, you know, and they farmed in between all these bushes. I don't know, I guess they did that a lot of places. They used to do that to keep the wind from blowing it and stuff, you know, because I know they did that in North Dakota. They always had a lot of hedgerows, but they've taken them all out. We set up the hospital and then we'd have, as soon as you get so far back that made it too far for the ambulances to bring the casualties to you, why well, another hospital would move in, they called it leapfrogging, you know, another hospital would move ahead of you and then you got rid of your patients and moved ahead of them when, it, when you got packed up. We went on into France, uh, Belgium, in Germany, and I went to Holland with the surgical team part of it. The outfit didn't go to Holland, but <clears throat> it was it was a slow time for us. It was an outfit that just come from the States, and they were having some problems and having two more than they could handle. So they sent two of our surgical teams to one hospital and another one and we went with another field hospital that uh, just come from the States and they were having trouble getting their patients going. They sent to us out there to help them. Getting the patients in and out, you know. It's, well, you know, in order to get used to getting that many patients in at one time, like this one colonel would say, hey, well, it, these outfits had been on maneuvers for two years, this one outfit, and all the colonel could say is, well, it wasn't like this when we were on maneuvers. They finally had the one outfit that went to the one, one surgical team. They finally had to close them up because they couldn't handle the patients. You know, you're getting in that many patients, you gotta be pretty well organized to be able to handle them. Well, in, in Belgium is where we, I don't know why they put us in the schoolhouse. It was one of the bad setups, but it was during the bulge and we, we had orders to stay no matter what happened. All the other hospitals that were there already were moved out. We were, that was when they broke through there, you know, and there was a chance we could have been captured. The Germans got within a half a mile of us and Patton came in and pushed them back. That uh, we was, they told us that night, they said, don't be surprised if you hear clicking in the heels in the halls because they're close. You know, and we were, that's when we were hit that night. Our hospital was hit. We had a Red Cross girl that was killed. The nurses quarters were hit. And uh, she happened to be in the bathroom up there and she was killed. It just took the corner of the building off. But all night that night they had been shooting. We could hear be a shell go off, you'd hear it, but it didn't hit, it would be close. And then in between that would be one of these buzz bombs, and then a shell, and then a buzz bomb, about every 15 minutes, that's what it did all night, till about four o'clock in the morning, they hit the building, and then it stopped. She was in the bathroom, where the nurses, there was, we were on the fourth floor of this school, the nurses were up there, and we used the bathroom that was on that floor. And uh, uh, she was a patient on the floor below. And they sent her up there to the bathroom. And uh, she happened to, some of our girls were in there with her, but they had gone out. And uh, she was still there when they hit the building. And she, she was from New York, she was killed. They announced on the radio that Patton rode in, and they said he drove. He was clear across France, and he drove all night. They called him and asked if he could make it, and he said, we'll be there. And they drove all night and come in at four o'clock in the morning and pushed him back. 
who were within a half a mile of us. We were busy, busy. We were getting patients in. A thousand patients a day we were getting in. We were doing surgery, shipping them out as fast as we could. And we were getting in. We were the only hospital that was left there at that time. They moved the others all back. Because, see, they knew that they, it was when they broke through, you know, there at one time at the... And, we never worried about it. Probably you just wondered what would happen, but you didn't dare worry about that. You had you were too busy. You had patients to take care of, and all of them were come from worse conditions than you were in. Well, then we went on after we closed up there in the school. Well, another hospital came and took over from us. Then I think the general hospital, I think, did. I'm not sure. We moved out in tents again. I don't know why we was in that building in the first place, but we were. Why they did that, I don't know, because I always felt safer in the tents than I did in any building. It seemed like the, you hit one of those buildings, why it's... The, I never, never worried too much in tents. We went to... Uh, Belgium and then on to uh, Germany. See, was there anything between Germany? I went to, I think we went from Belgium on to France, Belgium, Holland, Germany. We went on into Germany, as far as I can remember now. And toward the end in Germany, it was, we had old men and little kids. There were little kids that, they weren't as long as a cart, as the beds that we had them on, that were put out, and old men, as we'd say, well, Icky, they're older than our folks were. Some of those men that they had, they just gave everybody a gun, and, send them out. There was, we were stationed right close to a mental institution and the people there said that they send all those people out of that mental hospital, gave them a gun and sent them to the front. We had a lot of German prisoners. At the end of the war, when the war was over, we had nothing but German. There was a prison camp right close to us, just down the road from us, and we had a hospital full of German people, patients, and of course they were out there in mud and everything, you know, and it was sad, and, uh, but we had, did have their doctor, they brought in their doctors and their orderlies, we supervised them, and they uh, uh, came in and worked, took care of their people. A lot of them spoke pretty good English. The doctors, of course, they operated different. We had one incident that happened that uh, the doctor asked, it was a German doctor, asked our, our nurses still stayed around on the floor, let them take care of, but they stayed there, and supervised him, and he came and asked her for a large dose of morphine. And uh, she questioned it, and, and uh, that's what he wanted, and so she went and got the ward officer, our doctor, there was a ward officer for that thing, and uh, uh, told him that this doctor wanted that all that morphine, and he went over and talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, this patient, he said, he ain't going to get well, he said. He said, so we need the beds, he said. Well, he was going to put him to sleep. and. This doctor said, we don't do that. And he says, we do it all the time. He said, no need, and he's, he's just taking up a bed. And the uh, doctor said, no, we don't do that. You can't do that here. And well, the kid got well. We uh, were there, stationed there, and we come time to go home. And they uh, 
sent some of our doctors home. The war was over then, and uh, some of the doctors went home. Then pretty soon we got orders to the, for the nurses to go home, and some general in the headquarters decided we were still essential, and he canceled off the would only let 10 of them go. So 10 of our nurses got to fly home, and the rest of us were supposed to stay. Well, our chief nurse, that upset her, and she went from headquarters to headquarters and said, well, we had enough points to get home and get out. And so they, one day we got orders to, if we could get down to the ship, down to the dock, by a certain time, where well, they would get us on that ship. So boy, everybody was flying around there and getting orders, because in order to, before we could leave, we had to pack everything, had to turn in whatever equipment we had that, you know, had to be turned into headquarters and everything, and get orders made out and all that. But we all, we somebody ran down, somebody went down to airplane, Air Force there, and they got airplanes and flew us down there to, to where the ship was. And we got on the ship to come home then. We had to kind of start over. We had to go buy some clothes and, and uh, get things lined up. But I went right back to work at the hospital. I went home for a little while, but of course I naturally wanted to come back to town here and uh, came back. And, I went to work right at the hospital. I went to work on a surgical floor. And then I decided to get married. And I never went back to work then. After I, I worked till about a month before my wedding. And when I got, I was gonna go back to work and then I got pregnant right afterward. And so I decided, oh, I'm gonna stay home and take care of my kids. I was thinking about, because I'd had to go to school to take up anesthesia to give it. And at that time, a lot of the doctors were against nurses giving anesthetics. That was kind of a no-no, you know, here with some of the doctors. And, but my doctor told me he'd give me all the work I needed. I went, Dr. Armstrong come one day and he said, I've written to a couple of schools for you. He says, <laughs> I said, Doctor, I changed my mind. <laughs> I showed him my ring. I said, I'm not going to go to school. Our experience was a lot different now. Now they can tell anybody that they're going. We weren't even able to tell our family that we were leaving the States. We had orders. We didn't dare make a phone call. And when we went from place to place, we weren't, they didn't tell us where we were going. Nobody knew, and we could not write and say where we were. Now they can make phone calls to their family and, and everything else. There isn't the secrecy there was. God, nothing was ever told. I could never write. I would have, my letters would have been censored. Our, our, we had to sign ours that we censored it. Well, if they ever opened one of our letters, found that we'd written the names of some place where we were or something, why, that would have been enough to cause you to get in trouble and you'd have had your mail censored from then on. Well, it just, you just take it one day at a time. You don't. You, you just have to hope and pray that the right thing happens.